Ladies, I am thrilled to be with you tonight, and I, I, it's truly an honor. What a privilege we have to gather together as women, to have the community of faith, to have the enduring word of God, to have the power of the Holy Spirit present with us. It really is a joy, is it not? Plus, there was so much caffeine out there. So you got, you got to have it just pumping through your bloodstream right now. They timed it perfectly, knowing that in 20 minutes after they served you guys, you'd be wired. I want to tell you a little bit about my life in Dallas. I'm from Dallas, where I live with my husband, Aaron, and we have been married for 16 years. He is, and I think we have a picture of him. Uh, Kelsey's in the back working what looks like a newsroom back there. Um, but in Dallas, I live with my husband, Aaron. We've been married for 16 years. He's the lead pastor at Dallas Bible Church. We have one son. His name is Caleb, and he's five years old. He just started kindergarten. And oh, do we have, oh, oh, yes. Is he not just yummy? I did, oh, and he's precious too. And we also live with my mom. My mom just moved in with us in May. That's Noemi um, behind me. And at, my father passed away tragically last year. And actually what uh, Suzanne didn't mention is that she and Ken were present at Pine Cove in a time when I really needed a respite from life um, and from a tragedy in our family. So my mom has moved in with us. We're super glad to have Abuelita living with us now. Um, so we took a family vacation to kind of kick off our new roommate situation. And my husband, thankfully, was officiating a wedding in Maui. So P.S., if you would like a destination wedding to um, Italy, I, I would love to go to Greece, uh, I'm thinking about New Zealand, Aaron Armstrong is the guy. Forget Ken. No, no. You need to call Aaron and we'll make a family vacation out of it. So we went to Maui and it was so precious because building up to the trip, I kept trying to train my son about the beach because we've been to Galveston a couple times. And so we were like, well, it's, it's, well, it's not, it is, yes, it is. So when we get to Kapalua Beach at Maui and all four of us just are soaking our feet in the sand and watching the waves crash in, my five-year-old turns around as he's trucking it to the water, and he says, it's not like Galveston at all. <laughs> and I said, I know, baby, I was trying to tell you, I know. Um, when Virginia reached out to me and invited me to come and speak tonight, I jumped at the chance, because I'm a true Houstonian, born and raised. H-Town is my hometown. I mean, the humidity ruins my curls, but I love coming back to Houston, and I'll tell you why. I came to faith at 16 years old, and it was here in Houston, through my choir teacher, through my cheerleading coach at Houston Christian High School. I also started attending my very first Bible, Bible study when I was 17, or 18 years old, and I started going to Sunday school. I didn't know anything about what you people do here on Sunday mornings, but um, the place to be when I was a high school student and had just came to faith in Christ was the youth group. The youth programming at Houston First Baptist Church was incredible. If you wanted to have fun, if you wanted to make friends, it was the place to be. However, I started hearing rumors about this very Southern lady with very Southern hair who taught an adult Sunday school class. And at the time, I had no idea who she was, but here's what I knew, that she had handouts. She would do front and back dreamy handouts with fill in the blank. And at the bottom, there would be footnotes of these Greek things. I, had no, I didn't know who Moses was or Abraham was. So I don't know why I thought that I could hang with this class. But I heard that she went through the Bible line by line when she taught. And I thought this would be perfect for me. So I started skipping youth group and I would sneak into her Sunday school class, which by the time I went to A&M, it had grown to 700 people. It was Beth Moore. Beth Moore was my Sunday school teacher. And I remember before leaving um, to go to a and I approached her after class and I said, so what does one do if they hole punch your notes, binder them up, study them during the week, and then buy Greek concordances when we don't speak Greek and I don't know how to read it? What does one do next because I can't get enough? And I remember Beth Moore saying, you should go to seminary. I said, what's seminary? She said, it's graduate school for the Bible. I was like, what? This is awesome. Where do I sign up? I didn't know that it would bankrupt us. Um, but so thanks, Beth. Thanks, Beth. You owe us. So that's a little bit why I love being in Houston, why I'm so excited to be with you tonight. And in my preparation time, I spent a lot of time praying that the Holy Spirit would do something so far beyond persuasive words of wisdom. It would truly be a supernatural work, and you would sense you're here for a reason. And the God of the universe is reaching out to speak just to you. 
So with that, let me pray for us and then we'll open the word of God together. Lord, I am so thankful um, for Ken and Suzanne and their investment in this community, that they sacrificially love the people that go to this church and for their investment in me last summer. I pray God just a, a prayer over our time as we open the word of God. I pray for those of us who feel tired and weary already, and it's not even October. I pray that we would feel renewed, pun on our theme for tonight. I pray, God, that that would really be true of our group. I pray as I speak that they would not be my words, but your very own. And I pray that any distractions that we may have going on in our personal life, that we would set them aside to hear from you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Well, I may have alluded to it in my prayer, but I'm already tired. I am. So, I mean, I'm excited about Renew, but there may have been a little bit like, oh, get it together. You can do this. Get some caffeine and let's get in there. And I know some of you can relate because we're coming off summer and we are dirt poor. Because when you have children, if you have children or cousins or nieces or nephews or whatever, you have to pay for childcare if you work. And it's really depressing because at the end of the summer, you have no money. Or you might be in corporate America and we're gearing up for fourth quarter, are we not? I mean, this is game time at our jobs, it is. We've been working all year for this. If you're a nonprofit, you know, they say close to 90% of donors donate in the fourth quarter for nonprofits. So some of, you know, some of the nonprofits are like, oh, we're so tired, it's only September, help us. And we've got, I've got some friends that are in tax season. You know, there's a second tax season, I always forget about it, that are living at the office. And then for the women in here who are full-time caregivers, it is a miracle that we got our children to school, a miracle. And now we have to keep them in school right? Every single day and help with homework. So I know that some of you may be a little bit tired walking in tonight. And so as we kick off Renew Fall 2018, there's so much potential, ripe with potential for God to do an incredible ministry among us. And I think that's why your leadership team asked me to speak from the book of Galatians. Because there's a couple verses in Galatians that talk about flourishing that follows perseverance. The flourishing we can experience if we stay in it if we just keep going a little bit longer. But before we open the scriptures, we really gotta talk about some context of the verses we're gonna look at tonight. To understand the Bible verses we're reading tonight, we need to know about agrarian society, which in our postmodern age, post-industrial society, most of us are decades removed from agrarian society. I never lived on a farm. I don't know anyone who lives on a farm. I don't garden. Everything I plant, everything I purchase that is green dies. I just have a wake of plants left in my wake. So I know very little about this, and I bet most of you don't either. And so we have to go back and really think about what it would be like to live in a time and a place when we are completely dependent on the produce of the land. Whether it was livestock or we were growing produce, we're completely dependent upon that. So the agrarian society is right, right behind the context. And the only connection I can think of, even close, is with my grandmother, Elvita Lopez. She loved to garden. And bless her, she really tried to teach me how. My grandmother lived until she was 94. She was tough as nails. She lived in her own home independently for 53 years. And before she passed, she was still living there by herself and she would walk to the grocery store once a week when she needed to. And I remember um, her telling me a little bit about her life growing up, a single mom, two kids, abandoned by two different men, one while she was pregnant, I remember my mother telling me they didn't have a bathroom when they grew up. They shared an outhouse with two other families. So my grandmother, Elvita Lopez, broke the cycle of poverty. She raised two incredible kids, and she pulled off a lot of jobs to make it work. But in her free time, any moment she had, she wanted to be mowing her grass or working in her garden. By the time she was 80, we told her, <laughs> You can't mow the grass anymore because it's not because, it's because we think your neighbors are judging us. <laughs> I, I think when I come to visit, your neighbors judge us and as if we can't afford to pay, let, let us please. And she said, I like the sunshine. I like getting outside. It's good exercise. And then by the time she reached 91, I approached my mom and I said, mom, how, how is she going to garden? I mean, she leans over in the front lawn and she'll never get up. How is she going to turn the water on? How is she going to pull weeds? She's going to strain her back. And we're so far away. And I, so I approached my grandmother and I said, I would like you to stop gardening. And I know that you don't want to, but I'm worried about you. And she said, mija, 
I have been pulling myself up my whole life. And I remember thinking, gosh, I wish that independent, fierce spirit has passed on to me, but I know that the gardening skipped a generation. I know it. I know that the gardening skipped a generation. Now, if you're here tonight and thinking, why are we talking about horticulture? What, what, is, what, what is happening here at Renew? I wanted to talk about the Bible. Well, I want to remind you that the, the scriptures, these divinely inspired manuscripts, were written over 3,500 years by over 40 different authors. It made two testaments and 66 different books, thousands and thousands of Bible verses, but it's just one story. It's a story of God's love. It's got four parts, that God made something good, we messed it up, Jesus makes it right, and one day God will make all things new. That's the big story of the Bible. So we've got creation, fall, redemption, recreation. Did you know that every part of God's story is set with a garden backdrop? Creation happened in the Garden of Eden. The fall of mankind happened in the Garden of Eden. Jesus gave up his life in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. And then when he came out of that tomb, three days after he had been crucified for, to forgive our sins, he came out in the Garden tomb. And when Jesus returns to complete redemption and recreate a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation makes it sounds like the new earth is gonna be a new, Garden. So the garden motif is so powerful in the scriptures. It's a backdrop of so many of our Old Testament and New Testament authors. And so for us, I'm hoping I can close the gap a little bit. The closest I can get is my grandmother. But I'm hoping that we can step in to Paul's shoes as he's talking to his people tonight, the Christians that lived in Galatia, who would have keenly been aware of what it's like to live in an agrarian society. So with that, turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verse 9. And if you don't have um, a Bible with you, you don't have your device on, we've, we do have it on the screen, I believe. Galatians 6, 9, let me read it for you. My version says, let us not grow tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Let me read that one more time. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. I want you to hone in on that little phrase, doing good, not growing tired of doing good. What is Paul talking about when he's encouraging us to persevere? Because he's using language that's really specific. He's repurposing something he did in chapter 5. So I want you to see chapter 5, verse 19, where Paul is going to give a contrast between the way we should not live. No, no. He says, do not live this way. And then another option the way that comes with Christ, the way that comes with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in chapter five, verse 19, Paul says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. And that's a wrap. So I'm gonna close in prayer. <laughs> Super convicting. I know for me, what really stood out was the outburst of anger. Sometimes when you're in a relationship with someone for 16 years, you have outbursts of anger on the way to a speaking engagement or with your child because they won't put on their shoes. I, wa we wear shoes every day. Every day, we're going to wear shoes. <laughs> put them on, please, right? So I, I wonder if maybe you just sense, I need to get my life right. Already I'm sensing what God wants to talk to me about tonight. And what Paul does in his masterful way is he creates a contrast. So we feel the tension of what life may be like now and what it could be in Jesus, what it could be by the power of the Spirit. And so in verse 22, Paul says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And notice he uses the word fruit of the Spirit. When we look at that verse, it says, don't grow weary in doing good. Keep, keep watering, keep, keep growing all those good things. He's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So one way we could talk about it tonight is that when it says do not grow tired of doing good, it means do not stop cultivating the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And when we look at this list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, 
I've used Dr. Tim Keller's incredible summarization because they're so short, his little definitions, and I want to just go over those with you tonight. And what I'm praying is that the Holy Spirit would point out maybe one, two, three, I don't know, in my case, all of the things that we need more of in our life, that we need to be cultivating in our life. The first is love. And Tim Keller defines it, serving someone for their good. And he says it's opposite is fear. And I wonder what your life would look like, because I've imagined mine. What if people loved me? The people who are supposed to love me really loved me. They served me and not for their benefit, for my own. What in our world would change if we were all doing that and there was no fear in our life? What if we were cultivating joy? What if we didn't grow tired of developing a delight in God? And Tim Keller says the opposite is hopelessness hopelessness. And I wonder if you feel that way tonight, because I've been there. In a place where there is absolutely no light, it only feels dark. What if we didn't grow tired of developing peace, which is confidence that God is in control? He is. He is in control. And its opposite is anxiety. Patience. What if we did not grow tired of growing patience in our life? This is my favorite one. Ability to face trouble without blowing up. Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, too convicting, Tim. Uh, facing trouble without blowing up. And its opposite is growing resentment towards God. What if we did not grow, get, uh, grow tired of developing kindness in our life, that ability to serve others? Because its opposite is envy. And maybe you feel envy for someone in this room tonight, right now. And we don't have to live like that. What if we didn't grow tired of developing goodness, that pureness of heart, that you are the same person in every situation? Wow. Number one reason young people are leaving the church is because they feel as though we're hypocritical. And that's part of living the way we don't have to live in hypocrisy. What if we didn't grow tired of faithfulness to be utterly reliable Hello, my generation. Man, I got to work on this. I'm just telling you, it's so easy to bail via text message and social media these days, and we're so inundated with stuff. It is really challenging to develop faithfulness, to be utterly reliable on the people who need us. And its opposite is being opportunistic, which goes against everything we're taught in business school. At least it was for me. You are vying for the same jobs and the same positions. You will volley back and forth in your interviews and you have to get ahead. What if we didn't grow tired of being gentle? To be truly humble as opposed to being self-absorbed? Or what if we didn't grow tired of being self-controlled? The ability to pursue the important over the urgent. Wow, I, I can't even imagine my work life if I were able to be self-controlled. And I know for some of us, because I grew up in an addict's home, you think to yourself, I am so tired of being self-controlled. If anyone knew how much work goes into being self-controlled, and its opposite is impulsivity. And so I wonder, are you here tonight feeling that you are a person full of fear, hopelessness, anxiety, you feel resentment towards God, you feel envy, you feel like you are living in hypocrisy, you're opportunistic, you're self-absorbed, or you're uh, impulsive? We don't have to live like that. And I really do think what we sang earlier, that someone will be set free tonight. Because maybe you just needed permission that it doesn't have to be that way. That God has made a new way for us in Christ and he says that we should not grow tear, weary of cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. And I wonder if you're here and thinking, I am on the precipice of making this decision. You're seeking God, you're not too sure. You're here at the recommendation of a friend. Honestly, it was just to get her to stop inviting you. Like, this is the, this is the favor, let's mark it. It has been checked. Thank you, I'm leaving early. I know all about that. I do. I know all about that. And what I want you to remember when you leave here tonight is that there really is truth that you can grab a hold of, a new way to live in Jesus. Because there is one true living God, just one, and he is alive. <laughs> he exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he is love. He loves us so much that he put himself in flesh in Jesus to come to the world, to rescue us 
from ourselves, from our anxiety, from our hopelessness, from our ways of the flesh. And if you already start, start to sense adrenaline, a lot of people describe it as it feels like there's a spotlight on you right now. Your stomach goes into your chest, your heart starts beating faster. Many times this is what the gift of faith feels like for the very first time. Maybe you grew up in a very religious home that was wackadoodle, whack. And you're here tonight wondering if there is a new way to live that is in line with God, but different from what you know, and there is. If this feels like good news, that Jesus lived, he died, and then he conquered death on the third day, and he walked out of that grave, he proved that he was in fact God who he said he was, and that he was able to forgive sin so that we could have a relationship with a holy God. If that feels like news, good news, that's because tonight is the night. When you step out of envy and bitterness and resentment towards God into love and joy and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and gentleness, and self-control. And so if that's you tonight, make your decision now, right now. Now is always the time to make that decision. I want us to look at Galatians 6, 7, before we move on from this point. Paul says halfway through verse 7, whatever a person sows, he will also reap because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. And then it's our verse, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. You know what Paul is giving a shout out to? Two principles in agrarian society. Here's the first one. What you sow, you will reap. If you plant grape seeds, you are not going to get oranges. You will not. This is a rule. They would have understood it. It wouldn't have been related to karma or good works. They would have been thinking about the land and the produce and the fruit that would be born from the seeds that they planted. Also, a second principle that Paul's trying to hit on here is that in farming, in gardening, there's always a really long delay between the sowing and the reaping. And the in-between part is so hard for farmers and gardeners. And here's what Tim Keller had to say about it. New farmers and gardeners will experience a lot of anxiety, watching over the dormant seeds for weeks and weeks, feeling if they will never come up, but it always comes up in the end. You know what Paul knew intimately is how hard life was. He knew. In 2 Corinthians, the book is so wild. If you've never read it, it feels like he is being volleyed between joy and depression over and over and over. He's like, I'm a relax, but I'm not crushed. I'm, into, you know, I'm not despairing, but I feel down. I feel like my body's breaking down. He talks about being in anguish, feeling depressed, and then he talks about how good God is and the new ministry of the Spirit. And then you realize, Paul's a human. He's living life, the highs and the lows of our everyday experience. And what Paul knew is that we would grow tired of trying to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And he wants to remind us to keep going. Don't stop. Don't ever stop. Keep going. He recycles a phrase, that phrase, do not grow weary or do not grow tired. Sometimes it's translated, do not lose heart. He recycles it six times in the New Testament. He loves this phrase. And here are some of the synonyms for that phrase, don't lose heart, don't grow weary. It means lose heart, grow weary, become despairing, become discouraged, be spiritless, exhausted, or faint. Someone's like, oh, I die. That is me. That is me. He says, that, that is me. Then it's opposite. Here's what Paul is trying to communicate. And it's opposite. It's girding up. It's flourishing again. It's taking courage. It's speaking boldly. And this is my favorite, to dare. There is something inherent in moving forward in perseverance so that you and I can experience the flourishing Jesus secured for us. And it's this element of not losing heart, not giving up. Keep going when you don't think you have one more step because there's so much time between the sowing and the reaping. And if you keep going at the proper time, you're gonna see the fruit of your harvest. 
all the good that you have been stuffing into your children, stuffing in at work, putting out in the workforce, making sure that people know you're a believer, trying to do good to your neighbors, there will bear fruit in that. Because the law is what you sow is what you will reap. And that's gonna be good news for some of the believers in this room. When I was trying to picture what it may look like to dare, not to give up, but to persevere, I thought of my friend Lauren. And I wanna leave you with her story. Lauren showed up at Bible study a year ago and she was on a walker. She's very young, she, she can't be 35. She had a traumatic brain injury right after she had her son, Case, who's almost six. She was in church. She literally fell faint. She hit her head and she was paralyzed from the waist down. She lost the ability to talk and to walk and to eat. She is the strongest person I know. And not because she's rocking Michelle Obama arms, because she's strong, because she's got to use it for the walker. I'm talking, Lauren is strong in heart. She knows what it's like to persevere. And now that both of our children are in kindergarten together, I get to watch her make a very long walk from her car on her walker to go pick up her kid. And I roll down my windows each time with my son, and I say, there's our friend Lauren. She knows how to persevere, sweetie. That's what persevering looks like. When we were at Bible study together, she told me I lost the ability to speak and to swallow and to walk. I couldn't remember anything. And she told the Bible study group, I'm on a loop. I don't know what book we're studying. And you may have told me five minutes ago. Her husband came and approached me and said, hey, here's the situation. Here's what, how your group is going to be impacted by Lauren's presence. And of course, you know the moral of the story. She impacted us one billion times more than we impacted her. And I remember her sharing with a group saying she had been really deep into God's word before her accident. And she said, the only thing I could remember were the scriptures. The only thing I could picture was Jesus's face from the old, good old flannel boards in her Baptist church when she grew up. And she said, I can't remember my name sometimes, but I can quote Bible verses to you. And I remember her telling me it's because my soul has been a soil a good soil for good fruit to grow. Not knowing that I would be speaking about this a year later, it has really stuck with me. And now that we watch Lauren move on her walker every day and take the slow time it requires to get there early, to stay late, she refuses to wait in the car. And I love this about her. And what I told Lauren on several occasions is that you dare to go on. She said it's very hard to show up and to be the only person who needs help. She forgets what side of the door the kids are let on at every single time. She has to ask someone. Think about the humility it requires to ask for that much help. The reason I bring up Lauren's story tonight and wanted to close with it is because we need a mental picture of what sowing and reaping will look like in our lives since we're not going to actually plant seeds. We're gonna do what Lauren, do, what Lauren does on a daily basis, the hard work of getting up another day and trying again in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can truly harvest love and joy and peace and patience and all the good things that we want in our lives. Let me pray for us. I am grateful, Father, so grateful that what we plant, we will reap. And I pray for those of us who feel as though we have really been, really been working with you. And we have not seen results. Our life has not changed yet. And we want more from you. And I pray, God, that we would see your power at work in our lives in a new and fresh way. And I pray every time we step into these doors here at Renew every single month that we would be reminded to keep going, to not grow weary and cultivating the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.